Okay, uh, welcome to um, this afternoon's talk. Um, I'm just going to introduce now um, in Professor Ian Golden. Ian is the Professor of Globalization and Development at Oxford. He, at the Martin School, he is the director of the Oxford Martin Program on Technological and Economic Change. He was also the founding director of the school and led it um, for its first decade. So it's a great pleasure to, to welcome Ian um, today. He's going to be talking about his beautifully presented new book, uh, Terra Incognita, um, which has garnered accolades from um, sources as diverse as comedian Stephen Fry and Lord Martin Rees, the Astronomer Royal. Um, Ian will speak for about 35 minutes, I think, um, and then there is plenty of time for him to answer your questions. Now, if you look at the bottom right of the screen, there's a, uh, a button you can click ask a question. So please, at any point, just add your questions to that list. And note that you can also vote on questions. So that's your way of pushing questions you like to the top of the pile. Um, so please use uh, both of those functions. And I now give you Ian to talk about his book. Thank you very much, Julian, and welcome to everyone. It's a great pleasure to introduce Terra Incognita. It's a book which spans over a vast array of areas and really would not have been possible if I had not been at the Oxford Martin School, able to benefit from the extraordinary range, breadth and depth of work that is done. And as you'll see, many of the topics covered in the book are those which are the focus of individual work programs in the school. And it's been an enormous pleasure as part of this process to be able to consult with colleagues, but also to draw on their incredible data uh, and not least the data of Our World in Data and Max Rosa and his team who've done such an amazing job of creating a database which is publicly available. The book uh, was co-authored with Rob Mugger, uh, who lived in Rio, uh, based in Rio. So this was a book which long before we were forced to was largely done uh, through our virtual connection. And many of the maps presented in the book are done by the Carnegie Mellon University uh, in Pittsburgh and the Create Lab there, which is at the forefront of analysis of data, uh, satellite imagery, map making. And so this has been in many respects a three-way collaboration, although so many others have been involved because it spans an enormous variety of different areas. As you'll see from this table of contents, uh, the, uh, the maps cover a vast range of different areas, globalization, uh, climate change, and uh, urbanization, technology, inequality, geopolitics, violence, demography, migration, food, health, education, culture. I'm only in this 30 minutes going to touch on a couple of the areas. I clearly can't give full just, but we've identified 100 maps in the book, which we think will help people think about the future. It's a grand claim, 100 maps to survive the next 100 years. But what we hope is that the book provides perspectives, that if we act on that, we'll survive and thrive in the next 100 years. We live in an extraordinarily perplexing time, more happening more quickly than at any time in history. And of course, COVID-19 has highlighted that. But we also, have the ability, not least through our new data analytics, an ability to see ourselves at the microscopic level, whether it's a virus or at the macroscopic level, whether it's the Earth from space and the universe in ways that were unimaginable only 10 years ago. And it's that richness which we've sought to draw on in helping gain perspective, which we hope allows readers to make better decisions. And it's through those better decisions that we will survive. Because we are at a crossroads for humanity, the decisions we take will influence the world for many generations to come. Why Terra Incognita? Well, we chose the title because it's unknown world. We've always lived in an unknown world. And as the maps 
drawn on the earliest caves 20,000 years ago illustrate. We've used maps to try and think about the way that the world operates around us, to place ourselves in the context and to place other people and other places, but not only people and places, animals, of course, were amongst the first rep represented in these maps, as well as flora on the early, early maps of 20,000 years ago. Maps have evolved, and we need to be aware of the fact that they are a snapshot of what we know today. And so looking back at maps, one sees these extraordinary images uh, like these of maps that uh, do not accurately reflect the world. Ptolemy's famous Geographia from AD 150, a flat world, a limited world, a world with dragons and angels at the edges. And as I argued in my book, Age of Discovery, it was that revolution to be able to see the world as a whole, to be able to circumnavigate, be able to have compass direction, which led to the transformation along, which brought us the Renaissance. It's a fundamentally significant thing for us of how we imagine our world, where we see ourselves in proportion to others, to other places, uh, and to other parts of our incredible universe. We've all been absorbed in maps in dramatic ways in recent months and years, since February. And I think there's been no time in history and more people have been looking at maps. The maps of the spread of the novel coronavirus COVID-19 from the source in Wuhan. And as we've seen these expanding circles here represented on the John Hopkins map, we understand not only how the virus has spread following the arteries of globalization, but of course, how different countries have done so differently. Even within the US, how different states have done so differently. Within Europe, how different countries have done so differently. And the same is true in Africa. And what this allows us to use maps to do is not only to chart the progress, but to also understand the differences and try and make sense of the very, very different dimensions of this change. And as the coronavirus has absorbed us in maps, so too have the ideas around what can be done about it, whether globalization is going to be stopped by it, and how we can have a connected world without being vulnerable. And that has been the subject of much of my previous work. The first chapter of the book is about globalization. And I seek in this to display the sinews of globalization, to show how the arteries of globalization have created the most rapid progress for more people more quickly than any force in the history of humanity. And it's that connectivity which is absolutely vital for us today. The connectivity that comes from globalization, whether it's the internet and you all connecting to my talk today, or whether it's the ability of different societies to engage in commerce, financial transactions, and of course, to share good ideas like the Me Too movement and Black Lives Matter and bad ideas like those involved in very dangerous fake news, anti-vaccination movements, and so All the arteries of globalization, as we show, are both the super spreaders of goods as well as bads. These slides that I'm showing will come to an end, and then you'll see my face, because I gather that some of you are concerned that you can't see me. I'm afraid that's the limit of the system here. You should have a little snapshot of me at the bottom of your screens. Uh, but when we get to Q&A, you will see that it indeed is me speaking and what I look like. So globalization has been an immensely powerful force for good, but it also poses the grave threats we face. And so what we try and analyze in this book is how we can manage the sinews of the system 
whether it's the fiber optics, the transport, the financial, or the other links, to ensure that we are able to harvest the opportunities and mitigate the threats. As I discuss in my book, The Butterfly Defect, globalization endemically creates systemic risks. And by mapping its connectivity, we begin to get a sense of not only how it's connected, but also, of course, where the critical nodes and networks are. And it's these critical nodes and networks that are the weak links in the system. There are many ways of reflecting globalization and the unevenness of it, the dramatic inequalities in it. This is a representation of phones, computers, and other connected devices and submarine cables that connect continents with fiber optics and information. It shows the extraordinary density, the luminosity in white of the highly populated and wealthier places. It also shows the vast spaces of darkness. Some of these, of course, due to deserts, mountain ranges, the north and south. But what comes out of this very strongly is that some densely populated places, not least in Africa, in Central Asia, are not connected. There are other ways of representing globalization. This is trade flows. And what we see here is each dot in this representing $10 million of the flow of manufactured device. And what we show by doing snapshots over time is how this has dramatically changed, and particularly how China has come into the equation and how much more rapid trade within Europe has been since the establishment of the European Union, how extraordinarily robust. And you effectively have these three poles of globalization in East Asia, in Europe, and in the Americas. And it's these representations which give us a much better sense of what happens if you engage, for example, in a Cold War uh, and try and disconnect these different parts of the system, because they are so integrated. Of course, the underbelly of much of globalization is, is part of the bads, climate change and things like plastic. And what this representation of plastic waste shows is how, although it is concentrated in rapidly growing places, it doesn't need to be so. We see the extraordinary cleanup of the beaches of the Mediterranean, which used to look like the beaches uh, of the catchment areas in China, in Vietnam, and in other places, these big blue circles represented in Asia. And you also see the relatively low levels of plastic waste in parts of the US um, represented uh, by these blue bubbles, the size of the bubbles representing the amount of waste. So one of the things we can also do with these maps is that we can do something about it. The chapter in the book on climate change benefits from extraordinary images uh, which exist in many, many, many dimensions. But they are startling and very worrying uh, in many ways. The, the time lapses we have of the Amazon show how it has been eroded. This is Amazon being overtaken by a farmland, the deforestation of the Amazon over uh, the years. And you see this vivid portrayal from these maps of, an, of the forest turning to farmland, the slash and burn, the fires, and there are many ways in which we show this. One of the most neglected impacts of climate change is on the third pole, uh, the ice caps of the world, uh, the Himalayas uh, ice cap, the other poles, of course, the Arctic and Antarctic. And what you see from these satellite images, and we have a variety of them in the book, is the melting of the glaciers. Here we're comparing 1984 uh, and, 19, and 2019. Uh, both Rob and I have hiked in the glaciers uh, in, in the Himalayas, and I've been to the North and uh, South Arctic and Antarctic, and taken photographs which we use to display this extraordinary collapse 
of this massive, massive uh, ability. The fires we also depict, not least the fires in the Arctic, the melting of the ice sheets uh, in Greenland and elsewhere. You'll be familiar with the fact that we're in the hottest period in a billion years, but what we have in the book is images which are startling in terms of the ability to display using uh, satellite imagery, the changes in temperature over time. And that basically the redder it gets, the hotter it gets, and this inexorable process of global uh, warming coming from climate change. We also display the, the changes over time uh, of greenhouse gas emissions. You see in this early image of 1970, uh, that the US was by far the biggest emitter, much bigger than China, for example. Um, and by the time we get further, as China grows, its share gets bigger, the size of the circle representing the size of the emissions, and now um, China much bigger than the US. Enabling us to see the relative proportions of different places. What I found startling and wasn't aware of uh, before I did this book was the impact of pollution on people's life expectancy. The yellow circles reflect how many people die uh, of air pollution and the red circles from homicides, from murders. Uh, and what you see here is that for most parts of the world, pollution is a far bigger killer uh, than homicide, and this is not least the case in Africa where indoor air pollution, people cooking and heating in their homes, leads uh, to these high levels of death. This really puts things in proportion, and if we gave the attention to climate and to indoor air pollution that we give to homicides, I think we would act more strongly against them. This is fires and another dimension of climate change that we portray. And you see the fires spreading and the seasonality of it over time. We've mapped in the book using satellite imagery and uh, projections, the impact of climate change on different coastal areas. And here you see the impact on Florida of uh, climate change, a massive disappearance effectively uh, of much of Florida. Uh, you see Miami completely underwater with four degrees, uh, but even with two degrees, uh, much of Florida would disappear. This is not true only of uh, Florida. It's true of other parts of the world. As we show, this is the Netherlands um, underwater as a result of climate change. Of course, they will work hard and they're very good at it to stop this, but we believe that from the rivers and other flows, this will become increasingly difficult. And we do that for many places. This relates, of course, to the future of cities. And we use many, many different images in the book to discuss these. But one of the things that's highlighted from this image, which is the growth of Las Vegas, is that if you have enough money, you can effectively live in the desert. You can survive at four degrees a temperature increase and you pipe water from further uh, and deeper, uh, living, of course, on energy intensive air conditioned cocoons. That the growth of Las Vegas's sprawl and other uh, dense urban areas we chart, like, uh, for example, Dubai in the desert, we show the changes in Dubai's landscape, uh, are testimony to the fact of how inequality will change as a result of climate change. The chapter on technology looks at the origins of technological change, where it's going and how it's likely to impact on us. And this is one image that draws on work from my group in the Oxford Martin School, which shows patents uh, and their distribution. Now, clearly patents are not being developed over uh, the Atlantic Ocean, as you see from the dots here between Europe and the Americas, but it reflects collaboration between these different areas. And it's that collaboration which uh, is the heart of innovation. Collaboration within cities, between teams, uh, and between countries, and again, will be a terrible consequence of a Cold War. 
deep learning and its evolution is something we discuss and you'll see here an analysis of where it's happening and the changing role of different places not least in asia huge dominance from the coasts of um, the us the northwest uh, and the east coast but also a growth in europe very little of course in africa or latin america by comparison and that raises many questions of inclusion in that where is it going well including in many places is of course electrification and the transformation of energy systems to wind and solar and we chart the progress in that which is extremely encouraging and you see over different times how uh, now china is the largest producer of both solar and wind power what we do in the book is look at the growth of renewable energy but also where it's likely to go an underside of uh, technological change is the automation of jobs the taking of jobs by robots uh, by uh, automated systems and that also draws on work in the oxford martin school that we've undertaken the future of work group um, that I'm responsible for, which is looking at this with Carl Frey, Michael Osborne, uh, and others. And we chart how automation is likely to impact on different parts of the world. And you see the percentage of people at risk highlighting the point that this is not only a rich country issue. On the contrary, there are many developing countries which are more at risk than rich countries, where over 50% of the workforce are at risk. We spend a lot of time in the book looking at the distributional consequences of these different dimensions of globalization and change, not least with respect to income inequality. And there are many ways of looking at this, but one is to look at lights at night to get a handle on what's happening. What we do is compare, for example, Lagos, uh, and you see it here encircled, with New York same sorts of populations but new york totally different in terms of its energy availability in fact new york state as we show has more energy uh, use than the whole of sub-saharan africa it also consumes more antibiotics than the whole of sub-saharan africa we draw on the latest research to look at the implications of soaring inequality on incomes showing how the top 0.001%, uh, that's one in 100,000 people, have seen soaring incomes, while those in the lower distribution uh, have seen their incomes decline in real terms, both before taxes and post-tax and redistribution. Um, and there's a number of charts in the book that display this, including by country. The stagnation of wages, this is the stagnation, the blue line in real wages in the U US is something that we consider. This has significant political consequences. We believe it's behind the rise in populism. We believe that we wouldn't have a Brexit in the UK or President Trump in the White House had it not been for the financial crisis and the rapid increase in inequality and unemployment, stagnating wages that accompanied that how this plays through into the future is something we look at in a number of the maps going forward where we chart the evolution of geopolitics from the past into the future the ending of the 75 year old liberal world order and the creation of a more multipolar system the chapter on violence similarly charts how this is changing in place what the danger is of dying from violence, of being affected by it, showing that it's mainly an issue which affects a small number of countries dramatically. Uh, and it's highly, highly concentrated even within those countries by neighborhoods. And we show this through map representations. The chapter on demography uh, highlights the fact too, that many of us have demographic mindsets which are not able to keep up with the reality of extraordinary rapid demographic change. Uh, rapid in terms of the transformation of fertility, aging, and where people are. Well over half the world's population is in this zone, in China, India, Indonesia. And we show uh, how 
in this area, and particularly in East Asia, population uh, growth is slowing in dramatic ways. Fertility uh, much, much slower now than many people imagine. Indeed, over half the countries in the world are below replacement level. We show sh snapshots over time to reflect this. And what you see here uh, in the growing yellow is the growth of below replacement fertility levels um, and much of the world in that zone. Even in Africa, uh, there's an extraordinarily rapid transformation of this. Um, and we only have about five countries left where we think we will not be transitioning over the next 20 years to very slow uh, re re reproduction levels of fertility. And this, of course, is due to women's education, um, jobs, information, and options, having contraception and other tools. And we show that. So we need to remove from our mental maps the ideas of population pyramids. They still exist in a few places, like Nigeria. Uh, but the maps of the future, the mental map, should be much more informed by those of the Republic of Korea or the US. Korea more like a coffin shape standing up, and the US um, similarly so, where we have many, many more elderly people. What you also see from all these population projections, as we depict, for all countries of the world is many more elder women uh, than men because uh, women are wiser than men. They don't make as many stupid decisions in terms of drinking, smoking, and violence and live longer around the world. Also gender inequality at the bottom where people have the ability to choose and sex and societies uh, are very discriminating against women. People are choosing to have men. And so you get these very skewed dynamics going forward. Coming out of the demography chapter, we have a focus on migration, which has been a long time passion of mine. And this really is able to show very vividly how demography is confined largely to a small number of corridors. And these corridors are mainly corridors within uh, regions, not between regions. And that is very, very easily highlighted using uh, these maps. We depict uh, where the migrants are coming from and where they're going to. And what you see here, the blue is arrivals, net arrivals, the red net departures are from countries, is that within Africa, there are many net arrival places, mostly coastal, uh, and of course, Europe, the US, Australia, uh, and the Emirates, very strong net arrival centers. And how this is changing over time with the growing number of people going not least uh, to the Gulf area, less to Europe, less to the US. We depict refugee flows. Each of these dots reflects 17 refugees. And what you um, see in this is the, a story where over 90% of the refugees go to neighboring countries um, and they are the main absorbers of the devastation uh, that wars, conflict, and other sources of refugees create. Using these maps, we're able to show how countries suddenly become uh, major sources of refugees. You see Syria, not much, and then suddenly it explodes in terms of the number of refugees coming from Syria, Iraq previously as well. And this changes over time. So we have these starts and stops to refugee flows, and we're currently in a period, as we show, of the maximum. Most refugees in Africa to other African countries and in the Middle East to other Middle Eastern countries, very small shares of the flows, as we show, to the wealthier countries, less than 5%. The chapter on food shows many different aspects of this, but amongst them is the fact that we are not certainly running out of food, that there are a lot of sources of food, that intensity, the, for example, the Netherlands, one of the biggest exporters of food with very little and land in new ways, and that overeating is becoming a much bigger problem in many countries than starvation. This flip from malnutrition uh, to poor nutrition and particularly overeating. We show in maps the link between climate change, uh, and nutrition 
and we call for flexitarian diets. We also show how palm oil is devastating uh, Indonesia and Malaysia, the deforestation of that. This is the palm oil which comes from there, by far the major source of uh, international oil is these two uh, countries and the source of that is the devastation of the forests within those areas. We look at bovine meat trade in a, in a similar sort of way, showing how it is responsible for the destruction of the Amazon uh, and the connections between what you eat and where it comes from. This live trade in food uh, and animals, as well as the implications for the places it's coming from. A better awareness of where what we consume comes from is vital. A story which I wasn't aware of is how aquaculture, the growing of fish, is now much more significant than uh, ocean farming of fish or fishing. Uh, and this is the growth in China of that. And what you see here is that basically the, uh, the capture from oceans has stagnated. Uh, we are overfishing the oceans dramatically, but aquaculture has become a very vibrant source uh, of protein in many, many places. And that, of course, is going to need to be enhanced. We look at the connection between climate change and nutrition and are extremely concerned because our analysis suggests, drawing on Oxford Martin School work, uh, that the number of people dying uh, from climate change related nutritional local emergencies is likely to grow very, very quickly. And we show this uh, in these graphics uh, where we see the increase that's depicted in red of the number of mean deaths per capita as a result of that. There are many dimensions of life expectancy uh, that we consider. Uh, the one that's most important for most people is life expectancy at birth. Um, and what we show is the wonderful story here, good news about how this is improving everywhere and that it's really only a couple of countries in Africa where it remains under 55 years uh, of age, either through conflict or in the case of Swaziland, uh, Lesotho in Southern Africa, uh, HIV AIDS. But the progress in terms of life expectancy of over 20 years over the last 40 years is something that we're able to chart and we do project that going forward as well. The attainments in education are also quite astounding. Glo the improvements in global literacy rates, um, as the, our world in data shows around the world, there are laggards, uh, they're great sources of worry, in t not least in terms of mean years of schooling, but the convergence which we see continuing um, is gonna continue. We do discuss how COVID-19 is likely to set this back. And the share of the, the population with no formal education has greatly been reduced over this period of time, as well as we show in the progress of these maps. The internet and the spread of the internet is something uh, that is depicted. The, in yellow is those that don't yet have internet, and we see how penetration has improved, uh, and again, is likely to continue to improve. Culture is not often thought about in terms of maps, but we find what we can to depict uh, cultural soft power. So the growth of these Confucius Institutes, the British Institute, the German Institute, the French Institute, how they've spread around the world and increasingly Chinese and the withdrawal of the soft power power of the um, US and European countries. We also depict the decline of languages and other dimensions of culture, as well as in a fun graphic depicting the spread of McDonald's, for example, around the world and what that does. The concluding chapter seeks to bring together a lot of these different trends and provides policy recommendations, which we draw out of each chapter on how people have addressed these challenges. Why? the good stories have uh, been there and why bad, bad circumstances persist, whether it's in literacy or internet connectivity, whether it's in inequality, climate change, uh, or in other areas. There's certainly an extraordinary amount to be worried about, not least in this time. And as we were writing this, um, 
we were due to finish in January, but we ended up finishing in June to take account of COVID-19. The fires in Australia were happening and we were seeing the spread of the impact of climate change through fires in Australia, in California, in elsewhere, and of course, COVID-19. Take making an impact around the world. But we were also very taken in the book by the good news, by the fact that there've been in so many areas, tremendous improvements. One of them, for example, is on uh, mortality. Here's another way of looking at mortality, which is how many people under five uh, die. And uh, what you see here is just comparing 1990 with 2020. You see that whereas in 1919, large parts of the world suffered uh, from well over uh, 40 uh, deaths uh, per thousand life births. Now this is unusual and confined to a small number of African countries. Uh, that sort of change, and it's depicted in so many ways in the book, is what inspires us. The ability of countries to change their destiny and the ability of the world community to make a massive difference to that. And we chart how this coalition of willing actors, of countries, of communities, in many cases, cities, companies, working together, learning from each other, can make that difference. The story of renewable power in the US, although many might, are not aware of this, is also an inspiring story. It shows how the combination of incentives at the different state level is able to now, in many states, lead to renewable power being by far the stronger source of power, the greater source of power than fossil fuels. And this has happened over a very, very quick period of time. As we compare 1985 with 2019 in these images, we show the growth of wind power, uh, photovoltaic, and how this is likely in many states in the very near future to overtake other sources. Indeed, even in Texas, we think that is the case. In some, what we have in the book is a series of analyses of the key dimensions which we think will shape the future. Key dimensions which we believe will allow us to, by reflecting on them, shape our future for the better. None of these are set in stone, whether it's inequality or climate change or the pandemic or other dimensions, we believe that when we have this analytic capability, when we develop the community solidarity and ability to work together, we are, will be able to do that. And we hope that the book, by providing insights into this, gives people perspective, but also inspiration. We've been delighted with the early um, responses received. Uh, that Martin Rees said this was the book he would take to a desert island. Um, and that so many others have found it useful. And we hope that if you do take the opportunity to look at it, to get it, that you'll find the same. It's a beautifully presented book. Um, it's a book which unfortunately is rather heavy and um, that uh, requires some looking at. And there it is. Uh, a rather fat book. So that's my introduction to it. And now let me turn to the questions that um, have appeared. And I'll take the one first that has the most votes. And it is, do you think that humanity can continue to support globalization uh, and growth and be sustainable at the same time? This is a key question and goes to the heart of uh, what we've been trying to analyze in the book. And what it shows is that uh, these huge inequalities, and it's not about how many people are in a place. You have many places with extraordinary density of population, which are living relatively harmoniously with the planet, and other places which are living far beyond their means. I mentioned New York State as an example, uh, consuming more energy and antibiotics than the whole of sub-Saharan Africa. I do not believe that we can stop economic growth for those that do not yet have it. I believe that would be to condemn Africans, 
Latin Americans and Asians that are living in dire poverty to permanent poverty. Because even if everyone got the same income, they wouldn't be able to live a decent life. It's also the case, particularly after the pandemic in the rich countries, that we're going to have to develop a very different type of economic model to be able to cope with the growing inequalities, the enormous imbalances which have been set in, start, set in place. But what the pandemic has demonstrated to us is two things which I never thought in January would be possible in 2020. The one is that we can change our behavior very quickly. People have given up their social lives, they've given up their ability to travel, to fly, to do other things in a very, very short period of time because they believe it's in the common good. And particularly young people have given this up, which has been astounding, the sacrifices of the young for the old. We can change our behavior and we have to change it urgently to meet this challenge of sustainability. Climate, water, food and other areas. And certainly eating less meat is a vital part of that. But there are many other dimensions to that, including wearing a jumper inside rather than turning the heating on, changing to renewable energy. The second thing that the pandemic has demonstrated to us very forcefully is that governments can act and find the money when they want to. The old taboos of orthodoxy were totally broken with this pandemic. What would have been regarded as impossible for governments to do in January is now commonplace. The rich countries have set aside over 10% of their GDPs. In the UK alone, we've taken on 350 billion pounds of new debt. This would have been unimaginable in peacetime. It has never happened before. And so governments can act. They can support firms, they can support workers, they can find the resources. And some countries, particularly Europe uh, and South Korea, have shown that this can be done as part of a Green New Deal to create full employment and to create a more urgent carbon transition. So I'm confident that we can grow in a way that is sustainable. But it does require those two things. It, change, it requires a change in our behavior and it requires a change in government regulation and incentives to stop subsidizing dirty fuels, to stop the bads of globalization, not only uh, in climate, but in other dimensions, and to ensure a decent life for everyone. It, to me, the story is not about growth. We have to grow particularly poor people have to grow out of poverty. But it's about redistribution and the levers of power and about our own behavior as individuals at all levels, individuals, communities, cities, nations, and the global community. The second, ah, oh, there's a question. Sorry, I should have gone down the list here. Um, there's a question with eight votes. In writing the book, what findings surprised you positively or negatively the most? <laughs> That's a, a, a very interesting and difficult question. Um, there are many things in the book uh, which surprised me negatively. I hadn't seen the extent, uh, although I'd been up close to, of the melting of the third pole of the glaciers uh, and ice caps. Um, and uh, the extent to which this has happened shocked me deeply. I haven't seen the extent uh, of to which we are dependent on, for example, palm oil uh, from Malaysia and Indonesia. Uh, some of the demographic changes, I hadn't appreciated the extent of them either. Uh, and I think I hadn't appreciated the extent to which the US is engaged in an energy transition until I looked at the details with Rob Mugger, my co-author of that. Um, so there are many Good, good and bad dimensions, which have been surprising. I think I also did find throughout the book that trying to make sense of these maps uh, gave me a perspective 
historical perspective and a perspective about thinking about the way this will evolve, which was different. Uh, it's the breadth and depth of this. And working with Rob, who's an expert in areas that I'm not, he's an expert on urbanization, on violence, uh, and on geopolitics, for example, which I certainly am not, uh, taught me a huge amount about those dimensions. For example, that image of more people dying, many more people dying of pollution uh, than murder and crime. I had no idea of exactly the scale of that and its ubiquity. Um, that had nine votes. So I'm just going through to check uh, where what would be next. Uh, I think this one with four votes. Um, the book uh, highlights, uh, sorry, that's gone down now. Um, the book highlights so well the interconnected nature of the world's problems. Thank you. What needs to change for more countries to realize that more global coordination and improved international governance is necessary to help us manage these problems? I think what needs to change is a number of things. Firstly, pandemics are extremely unusual, and we highlight this, in that they're the only problem we face that really can come from anywhere in the world. Um, the smallest country, the poorest country, or the richest country and the richest place. Uh, and that requires, really does require global coordination. Although the things that will stop it, like vaccines, can come from one place. And of course, the rules, like those being embodied in the WHO, uh, can come from one place. But it's an unusual example. Most of the challenges we face, and this is highlighted in the book on climate, for example, when we identify the 100 countries that account for something like 70% of fossil fuel emissions the dozen countries that account for that, and within the countries, the cities. A small group of actors generally can solve most of most problems. The Pareto principle, you can generally solve 80% of the problems uh, with 20% or less of the actors. And we found this uh, very much building on the work of the Oxford Martin Commission for Future Generations, which Pascal Ami led, um, to be the case in many. And what we are able to do is outline who those actors would be. In many cases, it's countries, but in some cases, it's companies, it's cities that can do a huge amount, and we show that. It's actors uh, stopping things, like stopping the Amazon deforestation is going to require the big companies, which account for a large part of the trade, acting, as well as people changing their diets, and of course, rules and regulations, uh, satellite imagery, uh, and other dimensions of this. So I think we have been able to, uh, through this process, help highlight um, some of the governance challenges around this, and how one acts on them. Uh, clearly, uh, this is a massive issue, and not least in the context of what we discuss in the geopolitics chapter, which is polemic uh, politics, politics which does not embrace uh, these global challenges. And therefore, what happens in countries like the US uh, really matters. Uh, we highlight how much progress China's made on many dimensions, uh, but there's no problem you can think of that won't involve effectively, as we show, uh, China, the US, and Europe working together. And unless those three actors are able to work together, it's very difficult to imagine that any of the great challenges that we face uh, are addressed. Three votes. How are dynamic changes over time displayed in the book? Are there changing maps over time available online? Uh, good question from uh, Andrew Briggs. Uh, the, 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 the book is a... Um, a static book in the sense we have snapshots of these dynamic images that I've shown. Uh, but the Earth Time resource, which is behind uh, the dynamic images, uh, they, they have a website and you can go to the Earth Time website uh, to do that. We also are developing, Rob and I, a website which we hope will be more integrated with the book. But at the moment, uh, it's basically the Earth Time website which has much more and some of these images are also and we cite the sources for them are public available like for example the nasa images are available uh, on the nasa uh, website uh, our world in data on our world in data website and other publicly available uh, websites um two votes have you been able 
to map digital pollution <laughs> over other uh, forms of pollution. We've seen the lockdowns have slowed down pollution, but not necessarily right. And by confirmation, just checking, I got us. New York State consumes. Uh, yes, uh, that's the points are right on antibiotics and electricity, and um, and you'll see the numbers in the book uh, and. Digital pollution, by which I presume you mean fake news, the spread of bad ideas, uh, cybercrime as well, uh, uh, and others. Sarah, it's good to see that you that you online. Um, yes, there are some images which show bad, the spread of bad ideas uh, and bad things, and we discuss this in the text. It's the underbelly uh, of the digital, just as financial uh, transactions, which or uh, um, illegal, illicit, create financial disaster in the worst case uh, of financial flows and other vulnerabilities of globalization. So those are discussed uh, in a variety of places, including in the chapter on politics uh, and on culture. Um, so uh, can individual people really have an impact? Uh, or do you think it's only major policy changes that can change things? I would argue that it's individuals in the end, the summation of individual decisions that make policy changes. Uh, and even in countries where there appears to be no connection between the politicians and the people, like highly authoritarian countries, in the end, as I've seen from my own country, South Africa, uh, uh, in the end, individual will uh, does move societies, although it can be extremely torturous and painful and take a very, very long time. Um, so individual people make an enormous difference. And I think increasingly so because of our connectivity, uh, because we recognize we no longer atomized in the way that we were in the world before the World Wide Web and internet. Movements that start spontaneously, be it the Me Too movement, be it Greta Thunberg uh, and her actions on a whole variety of fronts, be it the Extinction Rebellion, uh, be it good ideas and bad ideas that spread uh, virally on the internet through social media and elsewhere. And so I do believe that, in effect, there's a battle of ideas and that unless individuals engage, they give over that battle uh, to those that um, could have very bad ideas. And so being on the sidelines and individuals not taking a position uh, whether it's in how they live their lives, what they do, what they consume, uh, or in the realm of ideas and digitally, um, in my view, is to uh, to effectively give over to the other side, to forces which don't believe, for example, in climate change or spread fake news about it or vaccinations or others. So copying, opting out is not really an option if you want to change the world. Uh, we can try and live on an island in a cocoon, uh, but the world will come to us uh, in the end as it'll tear down our forests, it'll lead to burning fires, it'll give us a pandemic or whatever. There's no wall high enough, even for the mightiest countries uh, to be islands, to try and stop climate change or pandemics by cocooning themselves in. And there's no wall high enough that will insulate the richest uh, people in the world from what's happening in the world. And so I I believe that what this hyperconnectivity has done and COVID-19 has shown more than anything else is a demonstration of individuals being connected, that we are only as strong uh, as our weakest parts. And unless we act together to manage this, uh, we are all very vulnerable. Uh, and I think that's been graphically demonstrated uh, through this. Um, I think that's all the questions that have uh, two votes uh, or more. I've dealt with the question on do we have a, there's not a companion CD. Um, uh, so uh, that's to go back to that. Um, Lillian Martin, we're approaching, thanks for, for watching, Lillian is, um, been involved in the Oxford Martin School since the very, very uh, beginning of it. In fact, long before I arrived in the Oxford Martin School, she was thinking with her husband, Jim, about creating it. So thank you, Lillian, for being engaged uh, and for everything you've done. 
uh, would approaching the different parts of the book in order other than arranged be advised does it rely on previous parts no it's an unusual book in that respect it's the only one i've written that that really doesn't matter where you start um in it if you interested in one particular topic climate change inequality technology dive in there i hope that you'll find the others of interest uh, but over time as you can also use it as a reference book um, and go to the areas that you that you want and of course the index uh, and table of contents on maps will, will help guide that but it is unusual in that I, I hope you read the introduction and conclusion though um, because those, those do provide a context I think we have time for a couple more questions if I'm quick um, have you mapped COVID and toxic air pollution uh, yes we have um, the book was completed at the end of June. Uh, Penguin, who were the publishers, did the most amazing job of, of printing it very quickly. They were going to print it in, in China, but then they ended up printing it in Italy. Um, and, and so we spread, we, we, we map COVID till the end of June, and that's our cutoff date. But in the way we approach it and pointing to what sources we use, we hope that that's helpful. Uh, it's a, COVID is a demonstration. Uh, of the butterfly defect of globalization. It's a demonstration of what we were already talking about in the book, which is the spread of other pandemics, Spanish flu, SARS, Ebola, SARS, um, MERS, and others. And so we link it to that and, of course, use it as an illustration, not only of how you can use maps, uh, but also how, you, how globalization can be managed and the very different ways in which different places have done it. But it does have to be managed globally um so yes uh urbanization and migration good for india uh yes uh you see my you know as i've argued in exceptional people and elsewhere migration is the greatest source of progress for humanity has always been and it's by going to places which have higher productivity by people coming together that they innovate that they create new ideas and that they conquer adversity so we are all migrants um depending on how far back we look and uh and increasingly urban and certainly that is going to be uh, the story uh, for india as well um do you have a map showing over time uh, possibly the last 50 years the change in poverty yes uh we have a lot of graphics on poverty we use the our world in data sources uh, and some of the others and these are uh in today's uh, terms in the currency of today. And thanks, Ian, uh, for also coming online uh, for this. It's good to, to see uh, you are part of that. I think um, I've got time for one more question. Uh, <laughs> let me take the most. Uh, where, OK, where can we purchase the book other than Amazon.com? Very good question. You can purchase it from uh, a whole variety of different sources, just if you if you look at it, you don't have to look at it at Google, which is, I suppose, the Amazon.com of the internet um, search engines. Uh, but it's available at Waterstones. It's available uh, if you're in Oxford at Daunt Books. Uh, it's available at Blackwells. It's available from hopefully all good booksellers and all good websites. Uh, and um, you certainly don't need to uh, buy it from Amazon. Um, oh, I see that someone's already put up some other links uh, to places for it. So thanks to you all. I'm sorry I didn't get time to go to all your questions, um, but I, I hope that if you get it, you enjoy it. And I hope that in any event you learned from this uh, presentation. Thanks to all of you. And thanks for Oxford Modern School for hosting me. Thank you very thank much. You. That, that was fascinating. Um, and thank you for racing through as many of the questions as you could. Um, just before we close, I would like to just ask oh, everyone who's still online, um, do keep checking the events um, that we have coming up at the Oxford Martin School. We have a busy program coming up. And for this audience in particular, um, you may be interested in our event on the 27th of October, again at 5 p.m., um, when we have Jeff Sachs talking about the ages of globalization and that will actually be hosted by Ian. So um, I hope we'll see you back then. And in the meantime, thank you, Ian, and thank you everyone for um, coming online and tuning in. <laughs>